Greg Bay, thanks for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. Good to be here. You uh, have been the president of the Illinois Manufacturers Association, I believe, since 1991. Correct. And now you're going to be making some changes. What, first of all, are the changes that are going to be made? Well, I'm stepping down as the president and CEO, Mark Densler, uh, who's been my chief operating officer and chief uh, lobbyist for the association for uh, since 2006. Uh, we'll be taking over. Uh, excellent choice by the association. I've been at the job for 27 years, uh, both personally and professionally for the association. I think change is always good. Uh, we've had a habit here at the IMA of keeping uh, executive directors or presidents around for a while. Uh, we're celebrating our 125th anniversary year this year in um, 2018. And there's only been six uh, executives that have run the association in that wow. 125 years. So uh, it's a job once you get it, it seems to like you sort of keep it. So Mark will be taking over. I'm going to still be uh, involved with uh, the for-profit side. We have a service corporation at, at the association. It runs a political fulfillment firm, consulting, polling. We ask America Polls as an example of some of the things we do. So going to be involved in that, but not the day-to-day -day activity. We'll not be representing the association as its chief spokesperson, uh, lobbyist, uh, and that will fall to Mark Denzler, who will be doing, I think, a great job for the association. We want to get caught up on some current issues as mm -hmm. well as look into the future, but uh, first let's take a little bit of a look past. You actually came in in the end of Jim Thompson's period, and then right. you had Jim Medgar, and over the course of your tenure, it's been a, of recent times, the last, uh, what, 12 years, 15 years have been rather tough, but uh, right. how, how have the decades for manufacturing, has it been a decline all the way through? Have, have there been times where we could say this was the golden era, at least of the, the time when you were heading mm -hmm. the association? Well, I think, you know, it's a, a relative term. Um, Manufacturing employment in this state has dropped when I was, uh, in 1991, we had just under a million people involved wow. directly with uh, manufacturing, many working in facilities. Today that number is just under 600,000, so you've lost a third of those jobs. However, the output of the manufacturing sector is still the same. It's about 12 and a half, 13 percent of the state's GDP. So it shows you what automation, it shows you the changes, it shows the significance of this sector to the Illinois economy. Uh, it's the largest single sector uh, of, uh, of producing goods uh, for the state. So it's a very important, so that, that has changed over time as uh, we have lost a lot of individual members and manufacturers over that time. Consolidation efforts, usually expedited during some slow times. You can think about it, we've had slowdowns in the state's economy in the uh, late 90s, as an example, the tech bubble, and then of course the 2008 to 10 uh, recession, the Great Recession. Both had tremendous impacts on um, business in general, manufacturing in particular. But what it is made and what is left and what's here today is a stronger uh, portion of our economy and what we're able to do. Uh, Illinois proposes some significant challenges for manufacturers, uh, higher cost, um, but we have other advantages, uh, location, good workforce to be able to call upon. Those are all positives that are there. But as I have talked about over and over on previous shows with you, and you've heard me talk about this, uh, there are things that do need to be changed in this state to make us more competitive in what we face. And there's going to be enormous change, it seems to me, in the next um, uh, decade, let's say, uh, in manufacturing. Uh, automation is going to continue to speed up the ability of a worker to be able to have a job in a manufacturing uh, facility. Is the requirements are going to get tougher and tougher. Uh, you just can't walk in. It uh, used to be we wanted a solid uh, high school education, you know, especially in downstate Illinois. Kids off the farm could come and walk right in and begin. Not the case today. You have to be able to have skills, math skills, and be able to be taught. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have those skills when you walk in, but you have to have the ability to be trained to run the manufacturing equipment that's in facilities today. I think one of the, from what I hear talking to uh, people, one of the problems problems that they face the manufacturers is as you say just finding the warm bodies correct with unemployment at these uh, almost historic lows and as we tape this at the end of November uh, 2018 the 
GDP in the third quarter grew 3.5%. It was 4.2% in the second quarter. So we see this up, upturn in the national economy. So one, that's caused a dearth of uh, new job applicants right. because so many people are already employed. Correct. On the other hand, and we often hear how bad the business climate is in Illinois from many sectors, uh, has the national economy, though, also raised the uh, economic fortunes of the Illinois manufacturers? It has. Um, energy, uh, let's take that sector uh, first. Uh, we are a major producer of uh, uh, oil pro products related to uh, uh, various things in the uh, energy field, you know, plastics as an example. Uh, we manufacture a lot of that. Illinois is particularly well located and has felt the uptick. The optimism in manufacturers, I have noted uh, really in the last year and a half, has been very, very upbeat. Now. There's a pall that has been cast with some of the things that are going on at the national and worldwide level, i.e. the whole tariff situation at uh, President Trump. Um, and we have members that are on both sides of that particular issue that applaud what the president's done. Others who say it is costing them money. And even in the same sectors, in the steel sector, there will be a portion that will say the tariffs are a good idea. Other side will say not a good idea. And as you noted, as we saw earlier this week, the General Motors announcement, one of the reasons uh, driving force to that, frankly, is steel costs that uh, manufacturing, car manufacturers uh, are having to pay more for. That spills through the Illinois economy because we are a big supplier network to the auto industry. So you see how these day-to-day -day things on a national worldwide scale come back and cause a problem for our manufacturers here. Now to the, the question of uh, employees. Um, we are retiring about 25,000 manufacturing workers a year right now. Well, the baby boomers. So the baby retiring. boomers as uh, they move through that process. Uh, on average, we are training in our community college systems and in other places about 13 to 15,000 people who are ready to go to work in facilities each year. So you see there's just a gap right there, let alone are they in the right places? Are they able to get uh, manufacturing workers in downstate Illinois in a small community or be able to get the right kind of workers to show up and be trained in a facility in the Chicagoland area? Because they don't automatically always fit location-wise. So our education uh, community is challenged to be able to produce the number of workers that we need, and that will remain to be, I think, a big problem, no matter how the economy is either up or down. And right now, I will say the, certainly with those numbers, it does show that in Illinois, the manufacturing sector is in pretty good shape at the moment. You know, we've covered stories with the uh, Illinois Community Colleges and uh, one down at Lewis and Clark the president's daughter came in there with uh, Congressman Rodney Davis right. uh, talking about workforce development. As we tape this, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, today or tomorrow, I believe, but uh, uh, Lakeland Community College over in Mattoon is, is announcing a program where they're having students working with a plastic manufacturing right. company. Uh, what do you think of these efforts uh, with the community colleges and workforce development? And the president has brought back the idea that, hey, not everyone needs to go to college and right. that you're missing some good paying jobs in the manufacturing uh, sector of the economy instead of necessarily being a white collar. Guy. If you go to a community college two years, get a certification, let's say as a welder or uh, the ability, and welders is a specific job that is needed uh, in our manufacturing sector, you immediately walk out. The average uh, manufacturing job in this state is about $74,000 a year. Now, that's not necessarily where you would start immediately at, but you can walk out, little college debt, making a, let's say, in the $50,000, $60,000 range in a manufacturing facility, full benefits of health care because our manufacturers do provide good benefits, 401k and other savings plan, unlike if you had not sure of what you're going to do, go to a four-year college, not saying anything demeaning to that, come out and still scratching your head of what you want to do and have a big college loan debt that you've got and to And your pay salary off. structure is not going to be necessarily, I mean, there's plenty correct. of people with four-year degrees or even higher than four-year degrees 
that are working uh, that for 30000 something dollars. The concern I hear over and over, though, the retirements, the vacancies that are coming, not only of line workers at manufacturing facilities, but the kind of engineering leadership jobs that you need in a manufacturing facility to be administrating, overseeing, thinking through the problems, working the problems that a manufacturer has, uh, are tremendously in need out there. And so I urge any of your listeners to have, who have young people at home and thinking about what they're going to be doing, go to your community college. We've worked closely with the community college system in this state to encourage this kind of effort. Some fabulous programs going on. The program you just mentioned, I hadn't heard of that, but applaud that. But in the Chicagoland area, Harper Community College has an example. One of the mm -hmm. leaders, in fact, we have had uh, Dr. Ken Ender, uh, the president of Harper, on the IMA's board of directors for specifically that reason, to have that kind of relationship and viewpoint from that side of the education community. And then we let's pair what we're talking about here with the other idea that um, we often hear about robotics and how we're going to be losing jobs. Now, maybe that's a necessary thing to some extent, and because right. because we're not going to have we we already have not enough warm bodies to go around. The baby boomers often were described as the the rat going through the snake. So you have this massive uh, retirement coming up right. here. Do you, what do you see when we look to the future and, and, and that whole workforce development, the implementation of robotics? Uh, are we just going to have to have those people doing quality work, the, the workers mm -hmm. using your brain as, as well as sometimes your hands, and not just, as you kind of alluded to before, a high school graduate from the 1940s or 50s, where you're just uh, you know, pounding well, bricks or something. I, as I said earlier in, the, in this discussion, the changes I think we're going to see in the next decade is going to be a lot of disruption in, our, um, in the workforce uh, pool as we move forward. The robotic situation, robots don't walk in the office, they don't walk into a facility and immediately start working. They don't work every day correctly that uh, they can fix themselves. The autonomous vision of, that you see in manufacturing facilities today has changed dramatically and this is nothing new. It's just happening from the packaging industry. Uh, you, when you look at Northern Illinois and you see all those warehouse facilities out in the Will County area and things mm -hmm. of that nature. Not many people working in those facilities, but they are there operating very sophisticated machines that are able to take pallets, make sure they're at the right door, put into exactly the right truck that is headed off to its location. Somebody has to be there to make that work. Somebody had to make that series of robots to be able to get into that particular manufacturing or warehousing facility. So it shows you how the interconnection of all this comes together. And indeed, that's where the jobs of the next uh, uh, decade are going to be coming from. Think about the autonomous vehicles that are coming and what's good, what that's going to bring uh, about the ability for the trucking industry to be able to deliver uh, things at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, exactly at the right time it's supposed to be at a Costco or at a, another kind of retailer or at a manufacturing facility who needs that particular piece of material that day for their production. You're going to see that kind of thing happening. Again, they don't happen magically without somebody overseeing it. And, the, and those are going to be the kind of jobs that my children and your, your children are going to be faced with in the next uh, years in the job opportunity market. As we, as we sit here, the president is about to go to, uh, I think it's, I forget which number it is, G20 is it, right, uh, is. meeting. And I often uh, point out to people that Illinois' number one trading partner is Canada. Correct. In fact, Alberta, can we bring in, we, we do a lot of trade with Canada, but uh, right. bringing in oil from the uh, Alberta the tar sands up there, we're a big refining state. Uh, but we at one point, Canada was buying one of every seven uh, manu uh, trucks that being produced by Caterpillar. Mm -hmm. So to what extent, as, as we look again into the future and talk about where the American worker is going to be, and this is something the president has run, run on. We talked about tariffs and how he's saying, let's bring the jobs back to America. Can America be competitive on an increasingly vibrant world stage? Absolutely. Uh, there, there's no doubt about that side of it. And you bring up specifically for Illinois the importance of the north-south 
trade that we have, both in Canada and with Mexico. There are Illinois' two largest trading partners of uh, our export market. We export about $68 billion worth of product. Just Illinois? Just Illinois. 20% wow. of that. 20% of that's agriculture products. The rest of it's manufactured goods. And we do think of, you know, soybeans and corn and things of that nature. But the foodstuffs, they have various other uh, machinery, as you just described, Caterpillar and others. Those are the big trading partners and the big numbers. And that's where Illinois is going to have to continue to think about how we're positioned to uh, grow the economy of this state, thinking about that north-south trade. China's important, Japan's important, the EU's important. But that is going to be, I think, a challenge for the vision of the, the leaders of this state coming up. And that's where I wanted to go. Now, we just uh, had a big election. We're going to have a new governor. We're going to have the Democrats are going to have a veto-proof majority in both the House and the Senate. Uh, rarely have I heard business people say the Democrats have the, the right approach to helping business. What would you, what message would you want the new governor and the new lawmakers to understand if Illinois is going to grow its economy, which we need to do to get out of the debt level we're facing, what should they be doing? How should they be approaching laws, regulations relative to the business community? Well, I hope that Governor Pritzker, Governor-elect Pritzker understands, and I think he does. He comes from a business background. He has been an entrepreneur. He's invested in businesses. He understands the cost of doing that. Um, the unfortunate thing, I think, on the horizon is that the Democratic Party in general is uh, moving leftward, uh, thinking that $15 an hour minimum wage uh, is uh, something that is appropriate, and Governor-elect Pritzker has talked about that. I have no problem about uh, minimum wage increases as long as they look at some of the other things that could be changed to help offset that cost uh, that's there. And it is an increasing cost. And also a philosophy that $15 an hour minimum wage jobs, not the goal. Minimum wage jobs in this country have always been talked about as the entry-level position right. to give you the opportunity to get experience and then to move on to other opportunity jobs that pay more. Fifteen dollars an hour only translates to about thirty-two, thirty-three thousand dollars a year. That's still below the poverty level in this state. So it doesn't answer the question of going from eight and a half, eleven, fifteen. That doesn't solve the problem. What will solve the problem is a environment, an environment that will grow jobs, allow businesses to want to come to this state to take part in all of the natural resources that we have. Illinois has grown over its history as we celebrate the sesquicentennial this year. It has grown because of our transportation opportunities in Illinois being in the center of the company, country, being able to make product, ship it to anywhere in the world, or bring it to this part of the country and then distribute it to the rest of the country. That's the kind of attitude that we should be having, not thinking that a $15 minimum wage is going to be the answer. The answer is going to be, and I'm not saying that the manufacturing level is ever going to be back at that 900,000 uh, people in this state, but to have more jobs moving in than we are seeing leave this state. And I don't think anyone would say that we've been seeing that for the last decade, and clearly the numbers show that. I gave a speech, two speeches, in the last uh, few years. City Club of Chicago. They both were entitled to the same thing. Illinois is closing one day at a time. I have gone through time and time again the examples that causes manufacturers particular and then when manufacturing leaves it causes a whole series of other things to occur. That we have got to stop that trend that the Jacksonvilles where I grew up to the Decaturs which is one of the more depressed cities in this state not growing population wise. We have got to provide policies, and this is the message to the Democratic leadership as they move forward, policies that will reverse that trend and have people wanting to be able to take advantage of the workforces in central Illinois, Chicagoland area, or wherever. And that's what we've been missing. I get to meet some in uh, interesting people and find out some interesting stories. And one of them that I recently experienced was going over to Paris, Illinois, we often hear how hard it is to bring businesses into Illinois, and uh, that might be true of anywhere in Illinois. But you think, you know, a Decatur or a Springfield, right. at least we're on major highways. 
How hard must it be to attract a business to Paris, Illinois, which isn't on a major thoroughfare, kind of about, as a lot of people would say, in the middle of nowhere. And yet, why I went there is because they've been doing such a job of attracting businesses, they've run out of people. 25% of their workforce now is coming into Paris from Indiana. Sure. Manufacturer may be one of your members. Uh, North American Lighting yeah. came in there. And now they've expanded four times. And I bring this up because the mayor over there is a trial attorney, uh, Craig Smith. And he, he said in 30 years, and we've talked, you and I have talked about the cost of workers' comp. He said in 30 years, I've never had anyone ask me about work comp. And he's represented both sides of the aisle, he said. But what they did do that's been very successful is worked closely with the business. You want to expand? We'll give you the land. Can, hey, can you get City Hall, can you get us the permits uh, in a month? No, but we can do it in 10 days. They really work as a partnership. And the mayor said to me, you, you can't attract a business to the town uh, or maybe the state and say, I hope you make money. You got to keep working with them in a partnership and that's why they stay and that's why they expand here and not in some other locality. Right. To what extent, when we talk about, and let's talk about work comp again, the cost of it, but to what extent can the governor, Governor Pritzker, and the legislature say, hey, if you, know, if you guys become more of a partner with business, we can overcome right. some of the negatives that maybe we have within the state? All due respect to the mayor, the workers' comp is the most cited reason when manufacturers decide uh, uh, that there is an inability to compete in their facility in Illinois versus another state. What's the cause of that? There's two main drivers in workers' comp. One is the indemnity, the issue of the fact that workers' comp is a uh, system that if you have a loss of uh, use of a limb, you lose a finger, even worse injury, a permanent or partial disability, you're going to be compensated for that. That cost is about 50% of what workers' comp fees, which is about a $3.5 billion uh, system every year, meaning $3.5 billion of medical cost and indemnity cost, meaning paying for an injury and the loss of it. So using Paris, Illinois, uh, not very far, I don't remember exactly the number of miles, but just across that border right. in Paris over there, <laughs> the idea of I lose this index figure, unfortunately, in an accident, and it is cut off, the cost or the repayment or the payment to the injured worker is going to be significantly a higher cost in Illinois than it is if it is the facility just across that state line. The other side of it is medical cost. So the idea that you go to a doctor and uh, the amount of money you're going to be charged and the question that they will ask you, was this uh, occur in the workplace or at the home, the reason they want to know that because they're going to be able to charge and are allowed to charge a higher premium cost for that medical procedure in Illinois than that it occurs in a state like Indiana. Those are, two, those are the two drivers of this particular. So the Democratic General Assembly leadership, and we've worked with them in 2011, we actually passed some reforms that we are finally seeing some of the uh, benefits of that reform. And usually work comp takes about five years, no matter what you do. Can I jump through in that? on sure. that point? Because I just recently interviewed the president of the Illinois Trial Lawyers Association, mm -hmm. and he was saying, we made the changes that you just alluded they to. They posted them, by the way, at the time, so let's just remember that. <laughs> okay. okay. But he goes, Nobody asked him about that, did <laughs> uh, But what he, he's saying, the, the reason the insurance costs remain so high here, and I just want to get your response to it, is that the insurance companies are gouging. Right. They're padding their profits. They're padding mm -hmm. their profits, that right. they're not passing along the savings, that if you look at the numbers. Do the trial lawyers believe in the free enterprise system? Competition. I assume they well, do. Well, let me just throw this. Uh, he was saying, you know what, I forgot the number. I'll make a number up. But he was saying there's something like 300. I don't know if Correct. that's, you know, an uh, insurance company goes, if right. business was bad, you wouldn't have people flocking here to be selling. But you also have insurance. a very competitive marketplace that if you, with that kind of, you know, if you only had a handful of insurers or if you had a state fund, which is sort of argued by that side of the aisle that, that we should have to be able to compete against the private marketplace, that w don't you think that those people that are running those businesses that want a larger share would be cutting their costs to be able to get a larger share? And no insurance company in this state has more than 10% of the marketplace in workers' comp. So it is 
is a very competitive market. The reason it is higher in what they have to charge is back to the same thing I just said earlier. They're having to pay more on the medical side. They're having to pay more on the indemnity side when somebody loses a limb or the uh, use of, of some part of their body. They're having to pay that, and they have to build those costs in there. They're not there to lose money. They are there to make money, but I must emphasize the driving costs are the cost of what workers' comp costs here in Illinois versus what it does in other states. And, and uh, I know when we spoke before uh, at a manufacturing, you were saying that I, I, it was extremely high, the numbers uh, here. Now, Indiana, by contrast, I think is the well, lowest in right. the state. And, we and we're made, like, what, in the top? Where are well, we? Well, now they've uh, said that we, are, are, uh, we have dropped to 22nd. And so those uh, changes I think we used to be in the top ten. So. We were uh, uh, we had gotten as high as seventh, I believe, is yeah. where we were. So there have been improvements made, but it can be better. And again, it gets back to the idea, to my friends at the trial lawyers: Do you see businesses knocking on the door? of every city in Illinois, or any city in Illinois, say, we've got to get to your location because it's cheaper to operate there? No. The word is actually the opposite. You're a more of an expensive place to be able to do business. And therefore, if you have a company making a decision on where they're going to expand, and they've got several opportunities to do it around the country, Illinois usually falls out for that particular cost. Let me ask this. You can punt on it if you want. But, you know, I'm wondering on workers' comp um, costs, is there another issue that's kind of subterranean and we don't talk about that, which is our hospitals have a lot of people come in who are uninsured, and they eat the cost of their care. Some of them get Medicaid, but sure. Medicaid, even if they get the Medicaid coverage, it's, what, 30 cents on the dollar, and then they wait nine or ten months to get paid. If they're running the hospital, and that's hundreds of millions of dollars going through there, right. a lot of costs. I've wondered to what extent the hospitals and healthcare providers of necessity are charging a higher rate. If someone has a work for comp claim, they're padding, no they're taking their, their money out of that because they can get paid when they're getting so underpaid from other sources. Right. And that maybe another thing we need to look at is the financial structure I, of our hospital system. I don't disagree whatsoever, and I also don't go along with the notion that our hospital systems are in dire financial shape. Now, there are some who have been in, in gotten themselves into that, but drive by any hospital, drive by Memorial here in, in Springfield or St. John's. What do you see? You've seen growth. You've seen new buildings. You've seen, actually, they're economic centers for mm -hmm. communities, right. especially downstate. Uh, so, yes, I mean, that's part of a much more global discussion on how we do pay for our, our health care in this country. So, but, yes, those are exactly what you described, I think, things that are going on. Uh, Donald Trump is uh, widely criticized by most of the political leaders uh, on the Democratic side in, in Illinois. I sometimes wondered in this last election if Mr. Pritzker has run against Donald Trump versus Bruce Rauner. Um, but is the Trump administration, their policies, are they doing anything that you could say has had a positive impact on business and... and oh, know, I think, I think uh, the first off, the climate and the feel of what uh, business leaders think about, that the Trump administration has been a net positive. They think that is the environmental area, that uh, easing some of the Obama area requir era requirements has been a, a net positive. Um, I think the, the notion of whether or not the strength of the economy is based on totally the policies or are we in one of those natural cycles that of sort of spinning up the economy as we have seen in our lifetimes occur right. and that there will be a natural pullback and slowdown and we may be on the front edge of that as we speak. Um, I think the president's ideas, uh, he has some very good ideas about how things should be going. I think there are some that are challenged, I think, that have an impact on the economy of Illinois. I think the tariffs are, are on the most part, a net loss for this state, what's, going, what's happening in the agriculture sector, what's happening in the steel sector. I think will, in the longer term, have some negatives that, that we've seen occur, and under Republican administrations. What he's doing is not terribly different than many occurred, remember, the Bush steel tariffs back in the 2000s. So um, I would say, though, that my board and my, the leaders I talk to, 
they're positive on what Trump is trying to do. We'd all like to see him have a little different mannerism and how he does it and how he says it, but the results are ultimately sometimes what really counts there. A while back, uh, we, the Illinois Channel, did some stories on some of your members uh, profiling them, and there's some really uh, very interesting characters out there, um, and I, I'm dropping the names. I think it's uh, one was the uh, flag manufacturer right. up in St. Charles, right. and here she was a 45-year-old woman at the time when her husband died at a right. young age, I believe, of a heart attack, and how she set, stepped in, not knowing anything about business, saved the business and, right. and, and grew it. And uh, another woman who I remember she telling her story um, was gathering odds and ends of uh, pieces of metal in right. alleys in a shopping cart and a single mother. Right. And now she owns a uh, salvage yard of some seven or so acres in Cicero, I believe. Right. Right. Uh, how many of those stories? I mean, those were really, I thought, very compelling stories of the, you know, we talk as we have about policies, but the guts that it takes to run a business to hang through these tough times, right. to, uh, and we've had a lot of tough times. Well, I, I think it's one of the things, the significant changes I've seen in my tenure here. Uh, the rise of uh, uh, female leadership, women manufacturers that have taken over con uh, companies, uh, much like the Janice Christensen story of Flag Source. Uh, she, uh, essentially, she didn't have to take it over right away. She had to, th I think, uh, replace the, the brother of her husband who had stepped in and was uh, basically running the country company into the ground and she came in after him and saved it with her her family a, a fa the only woman owned business that produces american flags in the country uh think about that that in the united states there's only one manufacturer that that's owned by a woman making that um uh, marcia serlin the woman that right. you're talking about is uh in fact she was told by uh, uh a colleague in the scrap business who when she was starting out and saying honey you should be at uh, water tower shopping instead of being in this business she laughs today and says she now owns a condo on the 87th floor in water tower <laughs> and uh how successful her business has been we're going to honor barry mclean at our 125th uh, anniversary in early december um, Barry's family is an example of what the backbone of Illinois manufacturing happens to be. Family-owned businesses. Barry is the third generation of uh, ownership of that company up in Mundelein, started out in the early part of the century. He has built that company. When he took over, I think it was around a $30 million annual revenue. Today, it is a nearly billion dollars a year annual revenue wow. that company produces. He's now turned it over to his son, who will be the fourth generation. I can go name after name after name of, of families that have done this, and that's what you really see, and it's what's made me very proud to represent uh, the Manufacturers Association. When I walk in a room and have walked in a room and I'm from the IMA, I'm pretty proud of the fact that that's who I represent and I've showed up to speak on their behalf. And it's been a great run in doing it because uh, they do symbolize, I think, um, what's great about this country, the opportunity of hard work, risk, and putting your money and capital at risk to be able to make something and be successful at it. Well, Greg Bays, uh, we appreciate all the time you've given us over the years well, and your leadership and helping to uh, restore the Illinois manufacturing base and keep it vibrant. I know it'll be in good hands with Mark Densley. It will be, and that's been a great pleasure. It's been a great run. We thank you for joining us. Thank you.